something. Um, in general, we are trying to get to as many um, uh, topics requested, but that'll never happen. Uh, I will be muting everyone that is not a speaker. Um, you might want to put in your view, you might want to put speaker, then you can see who is speaking at that time and find the chat, which on a computer is down at the bottom where you can ask questions um, or make comments that we will try to bring in. This is a huge subject that we're trying to cover and um, we'll do the best we can. I also want to mention that on our next one, two weeks, February 21st, we'll have Jen Verharn. She's absolutely fabulous. Those who haven't had any connection to her talking about tools for teaching, help your students ride to the other side of fear, anxiety, and self doubt. Um, I have told our speakers that um, I'm going to be merciless in stopping them if they start talking too long, because uh, we do want to cover as much as we can. And um, I have a bunch of questions and I do hope that you will feel free to um, uh, put on anything that you anything in the chat that you might like to cover. And I'll do the best I can, but there's no way we can cover everything. So I'm now, now going to start asking our speakers to very briefly tell you about themselves. And I'm just going by the way they're listed here on my list. So we will start with Allison. Okay, I'm Allison Stye. Um, I am a writing instructor in Dallas, Texas, and uh, I work with um, another one of our speakers, Yvonne, who's going to introduce herself in a minute. And so we work at the same stables. Um, we have a mixture of children and adults. Um, I'm not sure what else. What That's else good. Should I... Okay. That's perfect. So Yvonne, you're, yep. you're part of you and Allison work together. Tell us about you. Um, yeah, so we have uh, Rockingham Stables in Dallas, and I'm originally from Germany. So I did my apprenticeship as a writer, and then a couple of years later, I went back to do my master, basically. And so everything I learn and I learned uh, dribbles down to Allison and then another instructor we have. Um, yeah, and so we, we try to stay fresh that way. And uh, everything I learn, I just move on to everyone else. Um, yeah, and we have a kids program and we have adults too, so we do both. Okay, and Holly? Uh, I'm Holly McNeil, located in upstate New York. Yes, it's snowy and cold. Um, I have a slew of children, also adults. Um, I've been operating the facility for 25 years. Yes, I own my facility. Ooh. Um, and I am the author of a book by the name of 40 Fundamentals of English Writing. Okay, and Siri? Yeah, hi, I'm Siri Ingebrigtsen. I am close to Ottawa, Ontario in Canada, and I'm on the Quebec side. I've been teaching since 1981 and been writing under quite a few very good writers where I take my apprenticeship. And I've been teaching both writing school as up to 12 students in a, or in a group and private lessons. Yes. And where are you from originally? Far away. I came to Canada in 91. Okay. Um, I asked these, these people to speak because in my travels doing training, uh, uh, teach uh, team programs for dressage for kids, I've been to their facilities and was terribly impressed with the programs that they had specifically for kids. We're talking about kids, kids today. And um, so my first very simple question is how long, how young would you start a, would you, how young should a child be when she he or she starts riding? Siri, you're on the screen first. Yeah. So in my program, it really goes by personality and development. So if it's a very young four-year-old, I will not take them in. If it's a very young six-year-old, I will not take them in. If they're quite mature and have reasonable parents to work with, I will start them very very young with playing with minis and putting them on very safe horses on the line and then develop from there. In general, I would say eight to nine in, in my program. Anyone have anything to yeah. add or argue with or anything of our panel? 
I think um, Alison can totally agree. She starts the kids usually, and I hear her say that all the time. Sometimes our goal or rule is usually six to seven, but sometimes she's like, this kid is so mm. smart and uh, right. And uh, she's like, she's only four and a half or five and we, we try anyway. And then it usually works. So yeah, depending on the kid. When, when you start your kids riding from the beginning, do they have to do work in the stable? Do they have to do something off the horse? I guess is what I'm saying. Let's start with Holly. Uh, absolutely. From the moment they walk in the door, we start to uh, spoon feed them the information of how to groom, how to tack, how to lead, how to get on the mounting block, how to get. And so it's a, I call it the soup to nuts program. So in that, those first lessons, how much is on the horse and how much is off the horse, Holly? From the very first lesson, I just tack and I talk quickly about what I'm doing. I say that the whole goal here is to get you on the horse because that's what you really want to be doing. And then as time moves on, we slowly add more information because they can only absorb so much in any given lesson anyway. Anyone have anything to add of our group? Um, what are the most, if, what would you say are the most important things a beginner should accomplish and most age, young ages, in the first year. At the end of a year, if I bring my kid to ride with you, what can I hope that that child will be doing at the end of the year? Um, Siri? As so for, it really depends on how often the child rides, right? So if it's a very timid child, you're gonna get less done if they ride once a week, six months in a year, because it's too cold for a very young child to ride up here, we don't, we don't have a heated arena. So basically I want them to be comfortable on the horse, walk, trot, canter, no stirrups, no reins, closed eyes on the lunch line within the first season of riding. And oh, that to oh, me oh, is sorry. very fundamental. Yeah, and then uh, for sure tack up if they're able to lift the saddle or with help. So, and go out in the field, other riders. Allison, do you have anything yeah. to add? No, I think I think that it would be probably pretty much the same with us. I mean, it definitely depends on the kids, you know, like the kids' personality and also, I mean, like a timid four-year-old versus a, a 10-year-old that maybe the parent already says, let's do three times a week is gonna look very different. So, um, but we have, uh, we have kind of an achievement level system that offers a little bit of a guideline uh, for motivation so that they have, um, you know, kind of an idea of where they might want to be at the end of a year. And so, but we kind of tailor that for each kid. Can you give us a little bit of a little bit more about your system? Yeah, I mean, it's it's also set up like we do our achievement testing every year in April. So, for example, if a kid only started lessons in January, then they're probably going to just be level one, which is um, pretty basic. And it's an, an kind of an even uh, combination of horsemanship and riding. So for horsemanship, um, they should by then probably pretty much know uh, a variety of grooming supplies. Um, more or less how to tack the horse up. They're probably, they're maybe not strong enough or tall enough to do it all by themselves, but they should, um, you know, kind of, you know, not be totally clueless on, you know, the saddle pad goes before the saddle and, and stuff like that. Uh, and then with riding, um, like some of the other people said, we start everybody on the lunge line um, and, uh, you know, and until they're um, able to ride, confidently without reins, without stirrups, then we're, we're not moving on until then. So the lower levels, you know, within the first year is a lot of balancing exercises and coordination and just kind of demonstrating a, a confidence and an understanding about all of that. Can I add one thing quickly? Please. That, um, it's also good for the parents because we have the achievement testing. We send them, Edison sends them to everyone. So the parents have really something to look at and to know, oh, this is going to happen because usually parents are just there. They're watching. They usually don't know anything. And so they really can look at the sheet and they know what we are teaching the kid and it's, they love it. That's, that's a good, uh, yeah, something to add. Fantastic. Uh, we've had a question that had just come in. Are there minimum age restrictions due to insurance? Does anyone know anything? Not for me, anyway. Okay. Okay, good. 
Um, my so my insurance does ask if I uh, if I, we do pony rides, you know, so that sort of thing, pony lead line, and I think the insurance would be higher if we did that sort of thing, you know, the the birthday mm -hmm. thing. Right. Um, so I think there are certain uh, tiers to the insurance based on the level of uh, risk. And it would be by state also. So it's certainly something for, for each individual to um, check on. Uh, what are some, uh, most of you, I think, start with, with the lunge line. But once they're on the horse, off the lunge line, what are some exercises that you use for beginners or patterns or whatever? Just give, give a few examples of some things that you might do with beginners. Holly, you're on the screen. We'll start with you. Uh, beginners, I, once they're out there moving on their own, I like to do a variety of posting trot and sitting trot and we like jump position. I'll take out a Cavaletti and have them go over that and they have great fun with it, you know, just to being flat. So in progressing from there. Uh, Allison? Um, I do a lot of patterns with cones because, um, you know, and, and it can be like something really simple um, like, for example, the other day, I had a little girl where I just set up uh, two sets of cones um, kind of on a circle. And so it gave her just enough of a barrier to steer. And then I also had her doing transitions in one set of the cones. Um, and then and then once that got better, then we added also transitions in the other set of cones. So just something kind of like a measurable focus point. Um, where they can, they can, you know, and if they mess up, if they, if their transition's a little late or they miss the cone, then it's like, that's fine. Then you just try to do it differently the next time. Um, so it just kind of gives them something to measure so that they can make adjustments however they need to. Um, if, um, Siri. Yeah, we have a game that we do with all the kids when they come off the lunch line, which is the $20 bit game. So basically they have to tell us when they think they can do 10 circuits around the ring, sitting trot, no stirrups, and or 20, 20 meter circles without stop, without losing balance, without falling off. If they do while sitting on a $20 bill, if they do, they keep the $20 bill. If they <laughs> lose it, they have to make me cupcake and they cannot ask the parents to do it. So that takes a lot of fun into it, makes them really motivated. So, but they will choose the time when they're ready. And you it get works. a lot of cupcakes. Actually um, not, <laughs> disappointingly <laughs> enough. <laughs> Yvonne, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I think that was okay. all good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a question from the, from the panel, from the watchers. Would you rather have parents that are involved and watch every lesson or parents that drop the kids off? once age appropriate. I know what I'd say, so, drop the kids it. off. <laughs> Get the parents out. <laughs> so much anyone, easier. Anyone have a different idea? Yeah, I think so. Um, it depends on the parents. Yeah. It really yes. depends on the parents. If they're gonna make the kids nervous, don't come. I so. think actually, don't sit there with your phone in your hand. That is something that I really don't like. You know, watch your child or don't watch it, but don't sit there with a phone. I think that's what I see sometimes. And I'm like, oh, go home and do it there. Or, you know, but yeah. Um, when, speaking of parents, when should parents be encouraged to buy a horse for their child if they're so inclined? Who wants to start? I can kick it off. Okay, Holly, I, go for it. I always say, let's get the boyfriends out of the way. So wait till age 15 and see if that <laughs> kid is going to go with boys or horses because age 15 is the time when you'll see they either make their choice. They're going to stick with the horse or they're going to go for the boyfriends. Interesting. And it's been Alex? proven like over and over again. <laughs> But you also have good school horses where they can move up the ladder. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Allison, anything to add? I mean, we ha we have really a variety. Um, I mean, I have like I have one little girl right now. She's seven. She is not really a normal seven. She's super motivated. 
and um, she and she does already have her first horse and she is I mean she's out there every day and she's gonna go to her first show and do intro a and she's practicing like crazy every every day and um, so I mean I think it also kind of goes back to the earlier question of you know one kid versus another some of them um, uh, well, I, I do always tell, like, sometimes we have parents who come right away and they want to buy their kid a horse. And so those parents were like, no, 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 you don't know yet what kind of horse your kid will do best on. Um, so you have to wait until, uh, you know, until there's a little bit of experience there um, and we can can help you make that decision. Um, but yeah, I think it, I think it's it's such a variety. And I would like to say one thing that sometimes when we find a horse where I go, wow, this is a super horse. And then I ask Alice and I say, do we have a kid for this horse? And she goes, ah, oh, let me ask so-and-so, you know? And mm -hmm. then sometimes the opportunity comes up and the parents go, okay, let's have a talk. And if everyone agrees, then sometimes they buy a pony early, but sometimes it's because of the opportunity of the horse. Mm -hmm. Um, I know when I had people bring a young child to me wanting to ride and part of what I said when they were young, you know, can they take instruction? Can they follow direction? Can they focus a little bit? With that in mind, how would you deal with a child, say a 10 year old, who should be somewhat able to focus, who just doesn't pay attention? They're, you know, looking off here, they're giggling, they're making faces at the other people in the ring or whatever. Um, I can Who start. Siri? Yeah. So usually if there's inattention from one of the kids, I usually search myself first because then I'm not doing my job well. So then I refocus how I teach to get the attention back and put a game into it or do something that refocuses them to me. And that always works. I really don't have problems with the kids. So, yeah. Anybody, anything to add? Okay. How do you deal with a child who loses his temper with a horse? Same thing. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Same thing. Go um, ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I um, luckily only had that happen maybe twice or three times. And right away, I would shut that down right away, have them stop think a moment usually they will come up they know and they feel sorry and horrible and I usually don't have to say anything more and I will really make sure that that they know this can never happen and it may again but that everyone is shocked and it's it, I let it sink in the feeling and usually they feel so poorly that it doesn't happen again but um, yeah you have to tell them right away. Anyone anything to add? Um, we have a question from our group. How do you handle parent-child relationships when you have a parent that also rides and wants to give input and advice during your lessons? Not allowed, period. <laughs> <laughs> and leave. Yeah. Anybody, anything to add to that? Um, well, and a little bit again with parents, dealing with parents who have somewhat unrealistic expectations. You know, my child's been riding for six months. She's ready for her show. Why isn't she ready for her first show? Why didn't she win? Why isn't she ready to do FEI Young Rider, whatever? I can say one thing about this. Um, yes. we, we don't have that very often, luckily, but... Um, I think we we did a little bit more in the past and um i had some of the moms who were not riders but you know had had some of these expectations um and i i brought them in and i'm like well then you guys are all going to get a lunge lesson and um and they did and not and some of them didn't some of them were like you know they made excuses of oh no no i can't i can't for this reason or that reason but three or four of them did and they left that and i mean they only did it each for like 15 minutes and they left there saying, I'm going to shut my mouth from now on. I'm not going to say anything anymore. They're, they're like, I don't even know how she gets out of the saddle in a post. I couldn't even post out of the saddle one time. Um, and, and that kind of shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody, anything to add? 
I think it's, it's not uncommon that, you know, I'm paying you all this money. Why isn't my kid doing more? Um, I think it's a matter of just really, it's it, once the parent understands the dynamics of what's going on, they become much more realistic about the expectations that they would have. If, if they're coming from a place of say soccer, while well, my kid is playing, you know, first string soccer, they're out there and then they're performing and go hitting goals. Well, it's a very different world in horses. And as soon as they really get a taste of what's going on, they, they wisen up and, and they back off those ex unrealistic expectations. And I think, again, being taking the time to having those conversations. And I also love having, I've got some wonderful parents who've been through it and that I can encourage, you know, chat with, with Mrs. Jones over there. She can tell you a little bit about you know, the journey they've been on and that they, they see the, the long journey. Um, I've got another question. Um, and again, I think it's similar. How do you handle the child that argues with you or talks back and is disruptive? They don't. <laughs> <laughs> Not with you, Siri. <laughs> Anybody? Well, I think it comes down to just like we as instructors have to take charge of the horses that are in the arena, making sure that everything is safe and those horses are not running roughshod over our riders. We have to do the same with the riders. So I, I don't think a person who is running a program and, and teaching effectively, it, they're not gonna have a child run them over too much. I, I think the personality, the cult of the personality is going to really rule the day. And we have another situation where the parent is a rider and has their children riding, but the child clearly has other interests and clearly doesn't want to ride. Do you let it play out or bring it up with the parent? Listen, I think we had that happen several times, no? Oda? Yeah, um, yeah I, I don't know if I've actually had it happen where the parent is also a rider, but I have definitely had kids come that, um, it was maybe sort of the parents dream that their child would be a rider and it was um and and the i mean kids are pretty honest i mean i've had kids who have come and they're like uh i wish i would be at gymnastics right now <laughs> and you know or, or i really like uh you know ice skating better than this um and um yeah i mean i think when they're little then we kind of maybe will try to engage them a little bit more if they're a little bit older and it's very like a little bit more they kind of say it with conviction like they've already made their decision um then I have talked with some parents to say like you know this is uh I mean for one thing this is not a sport without risk and danger and I don't know if your kid wants to you know get bucked off and break their arm doing something that they didn't even want to do in the first place yeah anybody yeah. and I think yeah. that The risk is a lot higher in riding for somebody. Siri, we're losing you. Sorry. Yeah. Start again, yes. Siri. Yeah, I'm just saying that the risk to teach a child that does not want to be there is a lot higher because accidents are going to happen faster. So it's better just to tell the parents this is not the right thing. Uh, back to actual teaching, do you all teach group lessons? And if so, how do you handle a group lesson? So much of dressage is private lessons. Um, Allison, uh, Yvonne, I mean, should we start with you? Yeah, um, I actually, we think and talk about it a lot. Um, in Germany, you really learn how to do it. I think we do much more. I think the German system offers much more to really prepare people. But my advice would just be do it. Just try it. Talk to your clients. Try it. Um, yeah, I don't know, uh, just jump in and try to focus on two people at a time, uh, divide the time or let them even ride in a little line, you know, everyone does the same. In Germany, we write even first level tests, two people in a row. So there are certain tests and just let them do the same thing and yeah, just try. Um, and then you will get better by just doing it. I think that's just- Polly? Uh, I 
usually have groups of up to four. Um, and the way I operate it uh, on many different ways, but uh, one idea is always to say, okay, everybody pick a goal, one for yourself and one for your horse. What do you want to do? What do you want to get to? And everybody picks that goal. And then we work for the next hour um, and whatever we're doing, then I, we check in at the end. Okay. So how did you do with your own personal, you know, did you keep your fingers closed more? Okay. Yes. And how was your horse? Did you get him to bend more? Um, no, I didn't get that. Okay. Well, then we know next week. So it, it is a group lesson where we all operate together doing the same things, but they all have their own individual identified goals with a check-in at the end. Allison, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely we do groups. Mine are, mine are usually three or four, maybe five, or sometimes we'll do like a special group where we do a really big one for a certain reason. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think of it kind of like if you would go to the gym, you have maybe certain days where you have a private session with a personal trainer that's really focused on your own strengths and weaknesses and your, and you know, what, what, you know, your own personal situation um or sometimes you go to the gym and just jump into a pilates class and there's going to be certain things that you're like oh yeah this is what i'm good at and then there's going to be certain things that it's like oh i hope this only lasts a little bit longer and then we move on to the other things that i'm good at but still you you kind of just try to hang in there and get through it um and so um, within reason of course if it's you know something that you can do and uh because you know we know people tend to avoid the things that they're maybe not so good at and then they're never going to get better at it so I think it's great that people jump into the lesson and um, it also you know it, it points out like are you the one that's always the slow one that everybody else's horse is, is you know making laps around you or are you the one that's that's never doing a half halt and everybody else is you know you're just flying past everybody it kind of helps people notice that when in a private lesson they may you know we could tell them but they it's not really like so obvious Siri? Yeah, I don't really have anything to add, but I do most private now. I used to do groups of 12, and it was it's mentally very challenging to do big groups. So all of you, if I'm hearing you correctly, once the child is off the lunge line, they're still getting private lessons, mm -hmm. even as beginners. Group lessons are financially better. <laughs> I know. Um, and I think there's some, some good things about group lessons too, you know, that you can have somebody show somebody else something, demo. I think the, I, I grew up doing the, the, you know, nose to tail kind of group lessons where just keeping the distance as a, as a lower level rider was a, was a huge challenge. And then, you know, the person in the front cantered to the back of the line, that kind of thing. Um, I, I would add Lyndon that the group yes. lesson gives the kids an opportunity to find a camaraderie that they might mm -hmm. not have otherwise. And some of the, the friendships that have been formed in my facility are just uh, really long and enduring and they just love seeing each other. I mean, they're a real firm group and it, and it comes from having that group lesson. Yeah, yeah. I personally, I think um, group lessons can be very, 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 very good, particularly at the lower levels. Um, and you can also schools. school um, and mimic an equitation class. I think that's really important yes. if the kids shooting for that, they have to be able to go in a group because that's what they have to do. Uh, another situation, how do you deal? We've got two kids that are there and they're good buddies. They're probably buddies in school. And one is quite gifted in riding and the other one doesn't have much talent. Um, so, you know, Susie is seeing her friend, Judy, progressing so much more rapidly. Do you ever have that situation? You do. I, I think everybody hits it at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think talent is the most important, it's drive. So you can have a less talented and work on the drive. And that can be, you can manage to get around it by finding the strengths in the less talented rider and boost their confidence and give them exercises that will help them succeed, even if they don't have the natural balance or natural talent. So often those riders are extremely driven. If they see somebody else do well, they are very driven. 
and you can work with that. And I think going back to the goals, you know, everybody has their own goal. And if you have a goal that's within reach, that gives you a sense of sense of accomplishment. Anyone have anything to add? Um, yeah, a lot of times I have two or three teenagers that are the same age and there's always one a little better, the other one not so good. Um, and I think that's also a good opportunity to, as people just, you know, becoming adults, say it's okay to openly talk about what is not working for you or what is working for her and why. Look at your body, look at mine. I'm good at this because of, hmm, and you are good at that. It will come, it will get better, you know, but so I feel like that's also important to, to have the kids really discuss it and not say, oh my gosh, my legs are shorter or, you know, my arms are shorter or I don't have too much rhythm. It's, it's okay, you know, nobody's perfect. We all have issues and let's talk about them. Let's get them out in the open and I have them all help each other and really talk about our what we think is our issue. So that gives them, you know, like self-esteem and, and even if somebody would say, oh, look at your legs, I would go, yeah, sure, we know already her legs are a little shorter or her legs are extra long or this girl is extra skinny. And so they're, you know, I try to build their confidence by saying it's okay, you know, you are a little better, you are not yet. We will see, you know, kind of like, it's all okay. Um, important part of our program, of course, is our school horse. Um, how do you go about finding good school horses? Holly, can we start with you? And do they <laughs> um, pay for themselves? Um, some do, some don't. <laughs> Uh, luck of the draw. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, they, they come in so many different ways. I've purchased some, some have been given. Um, you just, I guess, you, I don't even know how they come to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think reputation for your facility might be part of it because uh, once like I got rolling with things, then I would have people actually reach out to me and say, I would like to give you this horse. And I'm like, well, what, you know, and I get the details. I'm like, oh, this is a nice horse. And the next thing I know, there's another one coming from a, a, a source that was related to them somehow. So I think as a reputation is developed because sometimes people don't know what to do with their older horse. So uh, personally speaking, I kind of joke that I specialize in geriatrics. So I have all these old horses, but people know that I treat my old horses with the utmost respect and care. And then I get these great old horses that I just, I have um, several school horses, actually the bulk of them are over 25 and some are over 30. So, and they, they keep going for me. I don't know why they're not dead yet, um, but they keep going. So, and it, it's a reputational thing. I think that's how I got most of my good school horses. How about you, Siri? Um, most of the ones I have are actually, I've trained them myself. So I know what I have. And some of them I've had from birth, others are a little older. Some are kind horses that I lease back for the school. And they all pay for themselves by being half leased outside riding school if need be. So instead of selling horses, we half lease them so they can get the, the riders can get experience with horse ownership without the commitment financially and time of full horse ownership. Allison, how about your school horses? Um, our, so, so as far as what we look for in a good school horse, well, right now we have had, we have three right now that we've had for a really long time. Um, and with our program, I mean, I think, I think the answer to that question would also kind of, uh, revolve around each individual program. Um, our program has changed a, a little bit over the year where we used to have a lot more school horses and we had a lot more variety of level of horses, um, and, um, and at one point we had, you know, a horse that could, you know, had, I think he, I don't remember what level, but he for sure was at least third level because he would do lead changes and half pass and stuff like that. And, um, so that was kind of fun for the kids who didn't have their own horse that, you know, and, and didn't have an experience to, uh, be able to ride that. And I think at the time we didn't have so many upper level horses at our stables in general. So that was kind of like really exciting. And then, and then we started getting, you know, our students started advancing and, and getting their own horses that can do all of that. And then we no longer had a need for that. And so we found him uh, a nice home. And right now we have three school horses that are all very basic level. Um, 
And, uh, and, and we have also a lot of horses in our barn, our other students' horses that they will let other people take a lesson on from time to time. So we have right now really no need for an upper level school horse. If we want a student to find, you know, to ride a lead change, I'll just put them on my other student's horse and then they can get that experience. And then if they're like, oh my gosh, I love this, then we move forward with them on whatever their goals are gonna be. So we, we make sure with all potential new students, if, if anybody would want a school horse that can do a little more upper level, we say, no, right now our school horses are really like, they're gonna get you in the door. They're gonna teach you the basics. But if you're looking for something to school, you know, anything more than first level at least, um, then we, we, you know, we would have to, it wouldn't be our school horses. We may have somebody else's horse that you could half lease or something, but right now we wouldn't need a school horse for that. So I think it just depends on, you know, how your program is working. Allison, where did you get your basic level school horses? How did they come uh, I think Yvonne has to answer that because okay. I'm not sure that I was involved in any of that. Yvonne? Yvonne? Oh, did we lose her? <laughs> well, I, I can at least Which answer. For, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I can answer at least for one. I know there was one that um, we actually had a student a long time ago who was looking for a horse for sale. She went and tried this horse. He didn't pass the vet check. And then we were like, and then the lady was like, well, he's not gonna pass the vet check for anyone else if he didn't pass it for you. So at this point, the price is going way down, but we like the sound of your program. Would you like him as a school horse? And so that's how we ended up getting that one. And we still, and that was a while back and we still have him. Uh, the other two, I think, I think Yvonne just, you know, found them high and low, like one in the mountains and one on Craigslist or, you know, she just saw something and thought like, I think, I think that sounds like it could work for us. Have I lost Yvonne? I think I'm back. Oh, I'm you're back. back. Okay. Do you have anything? To, did you hear that Yvonne? Yeah, kind of half of it. That... Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> Yvonne's gone catatonic on us. <laughs> okay, maybe she'll be, she'll be back. Um, how do you introduce your kids to competing? And I'm talking about, you know, the lower level kids that are coming up the ranks. Holly? Uh, we do and have for several years, just two schooling shows a year, one in the spring, one in the fall. So as the kids are rolling along, I'll say, hey, want to do a show? I found them high and low. Oops. Somebody cut me off. <laughs> We're having a little problem with, with Yvonne. I'm not sure what's going on. Go ahead. Anyway, Go ahead. the, the oh, schooling Holly. shows on property. That means there's no trailering out. It just happens here. So we keep it as low key as possible. And that's their introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, Allison, anything any different? Um, you know, right now, I mean, it changed a little bit with COVID because many of the shows are not letting people go there unless they're competing or an owner or something. Um, but in the past, we always would tell people, if you want to go to a show, you first have to come with us to a show. And uh, because we have our students do everything at the show, we don't have grooms, Every everybody works as a team to um, do feeding and stall cleaning and watering and taking horses for walks and things like that, helping each other out. And um, so it's a, it's a full long day. They do their own braiding, everything. And, um, and so we want to, I mean, we always, for anything, we want people to know what they're getting into, like what they're signing up for, not that they go and then it's a shock. And so, um, so usually we will say, you first come with us and you come and help and you watch and you are part of the team. You don't bring a horse. And you decide if you, you know, you can watch your teammate get bucked off as they go down center line and you decide, do you want to have a chance to do that? <laughs> um, and, um, and so now with COVID, it's a little bit different, but uh, I, I did just think actually the other day of possibly a solution, which is that the shows do need volunteers. So if they want to maybe sign up for a volunteer um, position, then that would be a way for them to come and just experience a show and see, you know, just the environment, if that's even something that they like. Siri, anything to add? Uh, yeah, so some of them uh, I bring down to an Olympic rider near us, Gina Smith, and we make like a little fake show where they, they have to ride through their test in front of her, which can be intimidating. So they're allowed to walk in the indoor arena and then they go out and buy their test in her beautiful outside ring. 
So, and that, that kind of gives them a little introduction and then we'll have an in-house cooling show and usually D for K. Okay, so. uh, is Yvonne back? Am I? I'm yes. not sure. Yes, okay. you are. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Do you, I mean, uh, Allison did a good job. Do you have anything to add? Nope, nothing to add. Okay, I'm sure none of you have ever had this, but when you have a child, um, the, the child who just will not work on something that is sort of, when I say mechanical, I mean, it's, you know, it's not like sitting the trot, but it's like keeping your right hand up or, or something. And, but it's something that's, that's fairly important and just will not change. Now, I know it depends a lot on what it is and there are different exercises for different things, but do you have a way of motivating a child to really work on something that they may think isn't so important? Anyone? I think Alison, yeah, with the younger kids, it's a little different. Yeah, I think, yes. Let's talk about the younger kids first. Yeah. So Alison, I don't know, the younger ones, how do you motivate them? Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of some, uh, some examples. Let me, while you're thinking, let me tell you one thing I did once. I had a quite a young child. I think she was seven, very talented rider, um, who just wouldn't pay attention to her diagonals. You know, just, she, she knew them, but it just wasn't important to her life. So I walked in one day with 10 Hershey, Hershey kisses. And I said, Isabel, these are for you. And her eyes lit up and I put them on the railing and I said, there were 10. Every time you you're on the wrong diagonal, I'm taking one away. Well, obviously she wasn't on the wrong diagonal once in that lesson <laughs> and that broke through her sort of lack of caring about diagonals. So I think bribery goes a long ways. Sort of like the, t the $20 bill that uh, Siri was, was talking about. Any other thoughts? None. Okay, that was a good question, wasn't it? Um, do you require your riders to show? That's a question from our group. Anyone? No, no Holly? Ours Allison? is a no. Allison, are your riders expected to show? We don't require them to show, but but based on their goals, um, we so we do talk to them about the benefits of showing. Um, because, I mean, I think to some degree, you're not going to really know, like if you're, if you're, what needs to work on, what needs to be worked on, or, um, you know, this, this big elephant in the room that you don't even know is going on, even if you've heard people say it, but maybe you don't really realize to some extent. And we just see when we take our students to shows, we, I mean, we can see, you know, throughout the show weekend, from one ride to the next ride to the next ride, they're learning so much. And then they're coming home and they're so motivated to, uh, you know, that they're not gonna see that their, their circle needs Ben by the time they get to their next show because they had it on all of their score sheets. And I had one little girl one time that, that came out of her show saying like, the judge said all the things that you tell me every single day. And I'm like, well, okay. And then she worked on a lot of those things. So. Um, I, I do think that, you know, I do tell my students, I do think that the show environment is very beneficial, whatever that means to you. Um, I personally, myself, am not just by nature a very competitive person, um, but I learn a lot when I go to shows. And so I use that as an example. If you're super competitive and you're motivated to, you know, you want to go to a show because you want to qualify for championships or, you um, you know, one of the FEI programs, that's great. But even if you just want to go to a show just to see what score am I going to get, like how good really am I, um, then, you know, then that's a reason also. So I, I do encourage them to, to consider showing, but I also tell them I realize financially and time-wise for some people that's not realistic. And, um, and if that's, you know, everyone has horses in their life for a different reason and and you know you make your own decision. Yeah. Siri? Um, so I agree. Uh, for most of my students, it's a financial restraint that causes us not to push showing because it's just not within reach for the clientele that I deal with mostly. What we do, however, is clinicians 
many times a year. So usually about five times a year, we have Cindy Ishoy or Gina or yourself. We have people that come in and provide motivation and feedback that we then can discuss for the next lessons. So it kind of gives you a little bit the same, but it's less costly than trailering to a show, buying show equipment, doing all the other steps. So for my group, that works quite well. And then we'll take one or two shows a year for the ones that want that. And we'll go, we'll fundraise and make it happen. Um, I have a comment more. I mean, maybe you all have something to add, but I just want to throw out what I found when you start children quite young and they're doing beautifully and they have a lot of feel and they can sit the trot and they can do all kinds of wonderful things. And then all of a sudden they can't. And I, that took me a little while to figure out that it's usually a growth spurt. You know, when they, when they suddenly grow several inches, things just don't work the way they used to. And I think that can be a little frustrating um, for them to understand, yes, you, you know, you're gonna get it back. It just takes a little time. Any comment on that? Oh, I, I, oh yes, um, I agree. I would just say, I've seen it with every person that goes through it and that's normal, hang in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, and then, yeah, but sometimes you doubt yourself. You think, have I not yeah. taught this person anything, this young person, and it was all going well. And now, no, I, yeah, I just tell him, I just tell him it's totally normal. Just wait. We wait it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. I mean, when it first happened to me, I, I did, you know, what did I do to this kid? She was so good yesterday, and today she can't do anything. Um, one thing that I've been so impressed as I came to all of your facilities is, sort of the sense of community um, that, that's been touched on a little bit, but it, are there things that, that you do to really develop that, that team, sense of team that you all have with your riders um, and a sense of community? I know at, at Rocking M, I, I'd be there and I'd see the kids you know, we'd be done and the kids are all in the ring doing some game, something mm -hmm. on foot. Um, um, yeah, so we, we talk about them. We don't we don't exactly know why, because you have a 16 <laughs> year old in there that should be really a little above every everyone. But no, she's there holding the pole for the five year old. Um, I think part of it <laughs> is that we have um, what we really, I think all of us, we don't like arrogance around the horses, you know, because sometimes we, we sit up high and we ride dressage and we're also beautifully dressed. And, you know, and so I really, I think we all don't like that. And so every time that sparks a little bit where somebody feels better or I have this or I have that, we are really basic. It doesn't matter how expensive your horse was. It doesn't matter if you can afford fancy clothes. We're all the same. We don't like arrogance. And uh, I think that is part of it, maybe that we're all the same, doesn't matter, you know, everyone is the same. And so maybe that's part of it that, uh, yeah, no arrogance whatsoever, mm -hmm. just because you own one horse or two or five, doesn't matter. Holly, you have such a team at Riding Right. Tell us how you, you bring that about. I was sitting here scratching my head trying to figure that out myself. Um, <laughs> I, I think it just comes down to that camaraderie and everybody's in it together and we're all accepting no matter what your economic background is. Um, it's really the people that make it. I don't, I don't know that I did it. I don't, I think it's just the people. I who think you came. did it, Holly. <laughs> You're the catalyst. <laughs> I don't know. I don't feel like I did. I feel like it's just the people who come in the door are just wonderful and the parents and the kids and everybody just has that same sense of um, kind of a family. Mm -hmm. Siri? Yeah, I, you know, if, at my farm, we have a lot of adults, uh, mostly women, and they are such amazing role models for the kids. It'll often be adults that ride at the farm and and have horses that will come and sit and watch the kids and give beautiful feedback. Like even when the kid is struggling and going back to something that was said earlier, when the body changes, it's really tough on these kids. It's mentally so challenging. And having other adults and peers, they're supporting them when they ride and saying, oh, you know, I went through that. And it, it makes a huge difference. So I find that having all the different ages support each other. It's really what drives the whole farm. 
And am I correct that in all of your stables, the kids hang out a good deal? Yeah. It isn't come and ride and leave? Yeah, like today, um, my I, today was my day off, but I went in there anyway. <laughs> and, and my students were all there um, from before I got there. Uh, and they were out in the field. I don't know what they were doing. And then they came back in and I don't know what they were doing. And then they were back in the field again with the pony. And then they came back in and then they were going out again when I was leaving. And I'm like, what, what are you doing now? And they were like, we left our jackets. And so I don't even know what they were doing the whole day, but they were, I mean, they rode also, but then they were also just running around doing, I don't know what. <laughs> I would say this facility doesn't have that. Um, most of the kids don't have their own horses. So it's a school horse thing. And, and when they come, they come for their lesson, but then they leave. So there's actually not a whole lot of hanging out uh, after the lesson time. Interesting. But there's Is a that tremendous sense of team. There's a tre tremendous camaraderie that I've seen amongst your riders. Uh, when they get together, they enjoy yeah. being with each other. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question? Is that because uh, they get picked up right away of their, because of their schedule? Because I mean, they, the parents could leave them a little bit longer because and we see that a lot that the parents go, come on, we need to go, you know, next appointment. And there's not much to do about it. Um, yeah, I would say that. And, and um, we're in a very rural area. So it's not like there's, it's not an easy drive. It's not an easy drop off the parent, you know, if there's, you wouldn't drop off your kid necessarily and leave and come back because there's by the time you leave, you've got to come back anyway. Um, so it's they come for their one hour uh, spot, which of course has you know tacking and taking care of your horse on either side of it, but then they leave. So, so my last question is not so much about teaching, but about being a professional. Um, breaking up is hard to do, and how. And when do you, do you instigate parting with a client? Uh, or what do you do when a client decides to leave you so it isn't too emotionally difficult for both parties? Anybody have some thoughts on this? Losing a student one way or another? I've never happened to any of you. You've never had a student leave you? Well, for yeah, me, I, I mean, I've... I've had a lot of very easy ones because, um, I mean, for me, some, a lot of times they just transition from me to Yvonne, um, who they already know. That and doesn't count. So, yeah, so that doesn't count. Um, but, and then I've also had some where, um, uh, you know, I, I try to be really honest and upfront when a student signs up for my program of exactly what my program expectations are going to be and if it's really the right fit for them. And so for the most part, I think that kind of will, um, you know, sometimes even from the very beginning, a person will say, oh, that sounds like kind of a little bit intense for what we were looking for. Maybe down the road, we would, we would want that, but maybe not right now. And, um, and there's another barn up the road somewhere that I will refer them to and say, well, why don't you go start there? It's a little more laid back. If at some point you wanna get, you know, a little bit more into dressage, then, um, then, then you come back anytime. And, uh, or sometimes, um, you know, it can be for many reasons. Maybe, maybe a kid at some point wants to switch to a different sport or they have something else going on in their life. And again, I, I, I always say, come back anytime. Or maybe sometimes they even, you know, we've, Yvonne and I have had many students that leave Rockingham and they go to another barn and then they're like, can we come back? And we're like, okay. Uh, and so, unless there's really like some sort of issue um, where it's very obviously mutually not working out, um, then for the most part, it's, it's for us, I think, been pretty laid back. And we've had people uh, who come back and they're like, okay, um, we want to, you know, we want to try this again. And we're like, that's great. <laughs> I think the, the biggest thing is not to try not to take things personally because there can be so many things going on in the background with someone. And one thing is um, when I thought about it more, everyone starts somewhere. And then the first bond sometimes is not what somebody sticks with. So they want to see what else is out there because they think it will be different or better. And then in their you know, experience, they learn, oh, you know, this is really how the horse world works. And I, 
I think I understand that now better too, that it's usually not personally, people just have to make the experiences as well. And maybe check out some trainers, one or two, and then they stick with the third one and they say, oh, that's how it is. That could also be it. Uh, Holly? Um, I've, I've had a lot of longevity with so many students, um, which I've been told is kind of odd. Uh, would I use the word odd? I don't know. It, kids, I start at six and seven. I have at 25. Um, and I have one of yours right now at 24, I think, that started you with you with when? Seven. Seven, okay. When she was yeah. seven, yes. So uh, I, I tend to have a, a our base program is kind of, you know, it's come try us out and it's really low key and there's not a whole lot of pressure and it's not about, quote, dressage. It's not about jumping. It's just, hey, it's riding. And then those kids, a great bulk of those kids will move on to something else, which is perfectly fine because it wasn't dressage that they wanted, but the kids who you can see it's sparking their interest, I start channeling them into the more intense dressage focused uh, activities. And those kids just tend to stay for a very, very long time. And you know, not that I haven't had people go and find another trainer, it, and which is perfectly fine with me because if that's what they needed at the time, I, it was fine. Uh, so I can't say I've ever had any quote breakups uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. Nothing was ugly or nasty or painful. It was just very correct for what everybody needed. I was in an area that was fairly intense horse area and it always made me very sad because I would have people come and interview or check me out or whatever and they'd say but don't let anybody know that I'm doing this I don't want my train my current instructor to know because I'm afraid she'll do something to my horse or I'm you know whatever and just horrifying to me and then on the other hand I had one of the top jumper trainers in the country who was in the area call me and say I'm sending so and so to you she will pay her bills She's a delightful person. This is what she's working on. This is what her horse needs. I mean, he gave me this wonderful introduction to this woman who, be, who became a client. And I, I thought at that time, why can't we all do it, do it that way? Um, I think there's enough for everybody out there and we gain some and we lose some. And um, I think, I mean, I tell my students all the time there, you know, I'm very good teaching certain people and I'm not so good teaching other people. And uh, you may find someone that fits you better. And uh, absolutely, why not? Uh, I have, we've run over, but I have one other quick question that I meant to ask earlier. What do you do with your young riders other than dressage, anything? Yep. You're nodding your head. Okay, yep. Yvonne. We are doing um, yeah, a lot of Cavalettis, poles. Um, I, I would say we like to take them out on the trails, but I don't think we do it often enough just because it's so nerve wracking because all the whole horses don't do it often enough. But um, <laughs> yeah, we try. We try to do everything, like really um, bareback riding, uh, everything. Backwards, forward. <laughs> Anyone's Holly, Siri? Yeah, uh, we, we do a little bit of jumping. We do Cavalettis, we do Jim Canna. We gallop in the field, We, depending on the level, of course, but they, they have to go out in the field even at very young and green age with safely horses. Um, so we try to, I really believe that any child should be pretty all-rounded, that they should be able to stick on decently over a jump and do a little course. So dressage is part of it, but they have to learn a little bit of everything. Holly, were you going to add something? Yeah, it, yeah, it's just the same. I mean, we're jumping, yeah. obviously, and, and trail riding and bareback riding and, yes, uh, quad have, drills. Ah, uh, yeah. We I also... Have, go ahead, Allison. Uh, in the summertime, we like to do a lot of fun activities. Like, we'll put on... Um, Every year I'll come up with some kind of themed game day where uh, like this last year was like a jungle themed, um, like you, like it, it's, it's a long story, but it had this whole complicated story of like, uh, you know, a quest that they had to do as a team and it had all these different challenges. Um, and some of them were horsemanship, like they had to, uh, I snuck into the barn overnight and undid all of their bridles and put them in a, in a trash bag with their name on it 
and they had to find it and piece their bridle back together. And, you know, so just different things like that. And, uh, and then riding portions as well, like different obstacle courses. We decorated the whole arena with le like vines and uh, jewels from the jungle. And um, so we'll do things like that. Just, uh, uh, we don't do that a lot because it's extremely time consuming and exhausting, but uh, I mean, the kids love it. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, we just, you know, we want them to also, you know, you're not just a dressage rider, but this is like just, you know, you just come and you're just a horse person. And yeah, one thing um, I think what yeah. you did in the past is that you have days where they help the guys. So they come in yes. and they also that you do some kind of, or we do, um, grooming, like grooming for you, right? So like they're a professional groom and you just really give them a list and then this is all the stuff they have to do. And they have one day and they help you in between and clean stuff and organize things and so they learn how to do that. I have to say, as someone who's been doing this a long time and who also grew up with a horse in the backyard careening around and as an event rider, it really saddens me to see how many kids I have now that ride well, that are afraid to go out in the field, that yeah. don't know how to take a jumping position, that you know, if you told them to jump a cross rail, they'd look at you like you were drinking. Um, that, you know, you ask them to go out in a nice big flat field and just have a nice gallop around and they can't, they can't do it. It's, I think we're doing them a real disservice by not um, getting them out there. The, the horse bucks and they just fall off. They never think of trying to stay on. <laughs> Well, you, should uh, send, you should send them up here in the snow. It's a soft landing. Yeah. It's a good way to exactly. introduce it. <laughs> well, that's what I grew up with. You know, it was fine to go. Um, but uh, I do, I do, you know, a dress dressage isn't for the wimps. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's try to develop nice, strong, powerful, gutsy kind of riders. Well, we've, we've gone past our time. Um, Oh, here's somebody that just, let me just add one thing. Somebody added, we had a picture day with a photographer that made them very proud. Cute idea. So I wanna thank everyone very, very much. Uh, we have recorded this. We will post it on um, YouTube. We have a YouTube uh, section. And um, I hope we'll see you all in two weeks um, with Jen Verharn. So thank you again. Thank you, our panel. You've been fantastic. And uh, stay warm, stay cool, stay safe, everybody. <laughs>